Thank you, um, PVC Naidu. I have entitled my little in, um, talk as Learning from the Past to Build Capacity for the Future. Uh, I'm not a historian, but sometimes I look towards the historians to guide me in what I do. But before that, I would like to first acknowledge the Kalevu and the Manua of Nandunga. Um, for giving us the, their mana and the space, this space, for our conversation today. I also wish to acknowledge the CEO of the Ministry of Youth and Sports um, for his opening remarks, as well as uh, PVC Naidu and the uh, Vice uh, President of COAL, MFET, and all those good people who helped create and proceed with the implementation of this gathering. I think, you say, you think, therefore you are. But thinking belongs in the depths of the earth. We only borrow what we need to know. And that little poem paves the way for my conversation because I am um, of the belief that for Pacific Islands people, in order for us to be successful in what we do, we must not forget our past. And we need to borrow from the past in order to map the pathways for the future, including the kinds of pathways that you good people are here to pave. I am but a simple teacher who has been involved in a kind of capacity building, you might add, at USP, where I have been involved with teaching and learning and research for too many years, since 1974, probably before some of you were born. That makes me very, very old, according to my grandsons. <coughs> so I shall take a teacher's approach to this task that Professor Naidu had given me, and I ask three simple questions. Whose capacity are we developing? In other words, who is the learner? Where are they coming from? In other words, what is their background? And three, why are we building capacity? In other words, capacity to do what? Or to be what? I understand that an important focus of capacity building in this conversation relates to women and also to youth. And the skill types that you are concerned about has to do with the use of technology particularly those related to open and distance learning and all that that implies. In order to provide some answers to these questions, I need to briefly share with you a basic assumption that for me, the important um, things for answering the questions that I have <coughs> asked, especially in the Pacific, in terms of our educational institutions are founded on the philosophies, the knowledges, and the value systems of Europe. But since most of our learners, that is most of us in this room, are not Europeans, as teachers and educators, we must contextualize, we must look at the content as well as the methods of our education in order for our Pacific peoples to understand what we want them to do. In other words, what we want to change them to. Let me first share with you the kinds of knowledge and value systems which have for millennia 
influence the way Pacific people live and learn. Their indigenous knowledge, their value systems, and their world view, particularly as expressed by their languages. I start with the premise that traditional knowledge, which UNESCO has um, defined as indigenous and local knowledge, is that which belongs to Pacific peoples and their communities. That's what UNESCO calls traditional knowledge. But for my purposes today, I would like to focus on indigenous knowledge, not because it's more important, but because we don't talk about it very much. <coughs> and yet, they influence the way Pacific peoples think and behave, most of them anyway not the ones who have been greatly influenced, like myself. The UN estimates that there are approximately 370 million indigenous people in the world. Some of those, as I mentioned, live in the Pacific Islands. UNESCO defines indigenous people as people of the land who are minorities in their own country, such as Maori in New Zealand and the Aboriginal people in Australia. I define indigenous knowledge as just people of the land, full stop. Because most indigenous people in our Pacific Island region are majority people in their land. But they are still indigenous. So what I'd like to share with you today is based on my own experiences and my study of indigenous people and their knowledges, which I have found extremely useful to my work at the university and outside of the university. And I define indigenous knowledge as personal, oral, experiential, time and place specific, and conveyed through an indigenous or cultural language by the people themselves. <clears throat> Indigenous knowledge has a strong element of spirituality, connectedness, and respect for other people other th and other things. Connectedness. So we are connected to everything and all things, to the trees, to the oceans, not just to other people. The individual is a very important part of the collective experience as long as the individual experience contributes to the common or collective good and not a function of self-interest or self-promotion. This rather utilitarian aspect of indigenous knowledge has had a great impact on my own life's work and outlook, manifested in a philosophy of acting in ways that would bring positive results in the community. If you ask a lot of our students at USP why they are there, <coughs> it's mainly because they want to go back to their communities and be useful to them. In Tongan, we have a, a notion of aunga. Aunga. So it's not really to promote yourself and to be very rich. The richness has to do with making sure that the community shares that richness. A people's indigenous knowledge is linked to their worldview, which is often categorized as relational, as opposed to the individualistic one. Our worldview, customs, and traditions are often expressed in our various languages, and manifestations of our group's core values are also expressed in our languages. These are the philosophical underpinnings of our beliefs, our assumptions, as well as our behaviors, especially how we make decisions and solve problems. So if we are involved in capacity building, we have to understand that about Pacific peoples. In my birthplace, Tonga, many refer to a set of core values consisting of respect. This is the translation to English, which is really uh, the closest, but it's not very um, apt, but I'll try, respect, compassion, loyalty, um, 
keeping the connections or Dauhiba with other people. In other words, relationships are very, very important. And these are evoked when we try to explain people's behavior and actions. When you do well, these values are evoked, and when you don't behave well, they will tell you that you have not been able to display these values. World views also help us navigate our life journey and make sense of the world in which we live. Our worldview may change, however, over time, depending on our own individual experiences. Other times we may be confronted with different or conflicting worldviews, such as that which many of us here today might have experienced as a result of our Western education. However, there would always be a dominant worldview in any society, even if our own individual one may be slightly different. Some of us have adapted our behavior and our performance by others' world, uh, uh, world views that we have acquired, sometimes expressing ourselves in ways that may be associated with other world views, as some of us do <coughs> when we find ourselves in contexts that demand such behavior. I often say that I think of myself as an amoeba, Remember the amoeba when you learned in Form 4 science? In other words, you change your behavior to suit the context you're in, even though you may not believe in the kinds of things you are doing and saying. It's a survival mechanism. So how do we know anything, anyway? How do we Pacific Islanders know anything? From our own experiences, as well as those of our ancestors, and this is where we go back to the past. Such knowledge as skills and values are derived from teachings over many generations, mainly through the mechanisms of storytelling, where each story is made alive with nuances of the storyteller emerging from the use of words, dreams, visions, intuitions, and a shared language. <coughs> Indigenous knowledge involves multiple ways of knowing is fluid and it can be found in the stories, the philosophies, the theories, the histories, and the ceremonies and rituals of our people. So what was it? What was it that you saw when the moon swam out of the sea? I saw an image of you. So, when was the first time birds learned to fly? It was when I learned to write. So here, I'm moving from imagery, from indigenous knowledge, to modern, to the modern knowledge that I have acquired. It is often difficult to compare Western scientific knowledge with indigenous knowledge. But then, I don't bother to define indigenous knowledge anymore. I just want to understand the processes associated with it and to see why it is relevant to the work that I've been doing all these years. But the dilemma that I face many times is that when I recognize the importance and the value of indigenous knowledge, I often try to analyze it using an Eurocentric point of view. This is because our context of achievement has continued to be Eurocentric. You know, those tests and exams and plans and strategic whatever. This is the very colonizing mechanism that is responsible for the demise of much of our, of our knowledge and our worldview. We return to this approach time and time again, at least I do, simply because the alternative is often too complicated, often unpopular, difficult, and, some place, and in some places, I, I might add, too dangerous. But as ecological beings, in order to survive, the indigenous mind interacts with the environment in a conscious way respecting and understanding that our future 
depends on our understanding of our ancestral knowledge, such as that involved in medicine, in weather forecasting, in food production, in navigation, whatever. But we need to know that our indigenous knowledge is continuously changing and evolving, adapting to our changing context, but rooted in nature and verified by it. Our knowledge provides explanations to most things, including what to do and how to behave. Our people have always recognized the complexity of the world and how impossible it is to come to an universal understanding of it. This is why useful knowledge can only be obtained through individual experiences that are considered valid to that space and to that time. Our ways of interacting with one another as well as with other elements in our environment are not fixed but carried on through generations and continually revised and built upon thus creating a web made up of the various experiences of individuals in our community. I sense that many of us and many of our people have always believed that things can be better between them and their environment, notwithstanding the very challenges that they face and continue to face. And you only need to listen to the people of Kiribati or Tuvalu when relocation is mentioned to them, many of the older people will say, we don't want to relocate. They are very optimistic as to what they want to do. This is particularly because it's not that they do not believe in universal laws that are supposed to govern how the world came to be and exist or how people should behave. This is simply because many of them believe that all people can derive their own beliefs in their own environments and circumstances, which to them, these beliefs are valid and logical. Finally, I see our philosophies as ways of being rather than a set of principles. As most of you know, Western philosophy is rooted in Platonic understanding of the truth. That is said to be present, to be stable, and immutable. But our philosophies, on the other hand, are embedded in the complexities of the world. This is well illustrated in how um, indigenous people and Western, Westerners view space and time. We were just talking about that this morning. In the West, time is seen in different sections, in linear, past, present and future. For indigenous people, time is, is um, circular. Time and space are linked in a global environment. For us, the past is the future. And if you don't believe me, do a bit of research using your own vernacular languages. Time is circular, it's not linear. So we look, we talk about the past when we talk about the future. So with these brief remarks about what has um, helped me in terms of my own teaching and learning experiences in going back and valuing my own um, indigenous knowledge and worldview, let me say a few things about why is all this important for education. So let me now turn to the relationship between indigenous knowledge and education, otherwise known as capacity building. For me, education, capacity building is the same. I think now it's called capacity building for empowerment. I used to know it as education for sustainable livelihoods. When I reflect upon indigenous education and edu um, indigenous knowledge and education in the Pacific, I find myself faced with the realities of the region, which is the first thing I would like to stress. 
These realities include cultural diversity. All right, so, and that's, it's very difficult to explain cultural diversity to many Pacific Islanders because many of them live in small islands. In Tonga, people cannot imagine a place like Papua New Guinea with over 800 different cultural groups and languages, or even Vanuatu and Solomons with similar diversity. But it's a reality. When you're talking about indigenous knowledge, you're talking about millions of groups of languages and knowledges. The, existing of com the, the other reality is the existence of communities in the Pacific with cultural histories, cultural histories that go back for millennia. That's very difficult to explain also to people, uh, particularly young people, or people who've grown up in urban areas in the Pacific. Okay? We talk about the fact that um, indigenous people in your country have been there for thousands of years. It's very, again, it's a very, for modern people like ourselves to appreciate when we make plans, particularly for rural people who appreciate that long history. The other, the realized, uh, sorry, another reality is the colonization and globalization processes which have had destructive forces in our region. And I don't want to dwell upon that, but I want you to take that seriously. And marginalized our knowledges, our value systems, as well as the people who own us. And finally, the influence of global instruments and other uh, educational and other instruments ostensibly created to help developing nations and people become more equal, more developed, more sustainable, and, might I say, more like other people. I spent uh, 10 years with UNESCO being in the Global Monitoring and Evaluation Committee for the Decade of Education for Sustainable Development. And most of the conversation I participated in had to do with helping them become more developed and sustainable. It was not helping those other people become less developed and, less, and, and not use as much resources to make all of us less sustainable. So it's always about developing nations, developing people to help them become more like us, so to speak. If you don't believe me, look at the curriculum of schools and universities. The concern with indigenous knowledge in relation to education has been driven mainly by different needs and different concerns of our region. And these include the concern for capacity building, especially uh, educators, women, youth, and apparently the underachievement of many of our young people, both in school and university, and you heard the CEO talk about those who are pushed out from schools. And not just those, but <coughs> those who are in school, but they're underachieving, they're not passing the exams. We also need to counter some of the dominant paradigms that are being given to us to study those things. You get me? So we're not only concerned with the issues and the problems, but we have to be concerned with how we get to know those issues, the kinds of research that we conduct that give us those statistics. That is important too. When I joined the USP in 1974, as I mentioned earlier, there was already a concern about the need for capacity building of Pacific peoples. At that time, it had something to do with how we represent ourselves to the world. That was the main concern at USB. We wanted to tell our own stories rather than leaving it to some other people, mainly researchers at that time. The move was spearheaded by creative writers under the guardianship 
of the Samoan novelist and poet Albert Wendt. Others like Professor Ron Crocom and his wife Marjorie, Dr. Howard Ventries, Professor Subramani, he wasn't a professor at the time, and Satendra Nandan, and many Fiji born uh, creative artists. However, the move to publish Pacific writing was not as enthusiastically taken up by Pacific curriculum personnel until much later, in the early 1990s, when UNESCO decided to have a workshop, kind of like this one in Rarotonga, in, um, where it was agreed that Pacific people should take ownership of what they teach the young people in both school and university. This opened up opportunities for some of us who had been working in the area of curriculum reform and who advocated for the inclusion of things specific in the school curriculum, especially our languages, <coughs> even our sports, our traditional sports. Nearly three decades later, we are still doing capacity building to support our curriculum reforms in the Pacific. And it has nothing to do with ensuring ownership of the curriculum as much as reforming our curriculum so that it is linked and it is accredited by overseas um, school authorities. In other words, we have shifted from what our ministers agreed to in the 1990s to ensure ownership of what we teach and what we learn and what we research, to creating a curriculum that reflects what is happening in other parts of the world. I'm not against borrowing things from um, more developed countries, but what I'd like to remind you that we have to keep that in mind. We have to own what we are creating, because if we don't own it, that's the people who want to learn, the people we want, to, uh, to help in terms of capacity building, are not going, that's not going to be useful for them. Unless, of course, they migrate somewhere. <laughs> However, some of us are pretty serious. We're still serious about that Rarotonga Declaration. And we wanted to work towards um, implementing some of their recommendations. In 2001, a small group of Pacific educators and researchers met to create the Rethinking Pacific Education, and this was helpfully supported by, at that time, NZAID, now called what? M MFAD. These things keep changing. But they funded it. They were the only ones who wanted to fund it because we, we had an insider at, at, in NZAID who was from Fiji originally, and wanted to help us. So we created this Rethinking Pacific Education um, group, to which we're still going. And we seriously wanted to discuss the failure of our formal education system to, full, um, to fulfill our so society's expectations, in particularly facilitating social and economic development. A decade later, a decade later from 2001, um, the Pacific Ministers of Education endorsed a regional framework for culture and education, a move that meant, among other things, Pacific schools and educational institutions would take steps to include Pacific knowledge and values in the curriculum of school and higher education. This was agreed to by the ministers of education at their meeting in Papua New Guinea. This meant that educational personnel needed to first understand major differences between indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge systems. So until that happened, nothing very useful would have um, occurred. For example, the way indigenous knowledge is usually concerned with meaning and relevance rather than classification and definitions. These are some of the things we needed to learn or to relearn. Or the idea that understanding is being able to find meaning 
and knowing how to interpret and respond to one's environment. Furthermore, knowledge is said to be revealed in a gradual manner at different times, at different levels, as appropriate. And transmitting of this knowledge is fluid and context specific. This kind of fluidity in our traditional knowledge is one that is making academics feel very um, unsteady. We also know that the emphasis of formal education is quite different from that of indigenous education. And I won't go through all the differences, but if you draw a diagram, the purpose of traditional knowledge is totally different to formal education. One is to, for cultural survival and continuity. It's the purpose of learning in indigenous societies. In schools and universities, it is to transform people, to change people from one state to another. So I always say to my students, you want to be a teacher in a school? Remember, you have to go around changing everybody. If you don't want to change somebody, you give up teaching. And we heard that now. We want you, we need to transform people. Not to make them look like other people, but try and build their capacities. Content. So the content of our traditional education is sourced from our cultures. Content of our schools and institutions are sourced from other people's cultures. Even in assessment, we assess learning in traditional societies through looking at people's behavior and their performance. So if you appear and dance in public and you make the wrong moves or you don't do it properly, People say, go. Oh. They don't say, oh, how terrible so and so is dancing. They'll say, who taught her to dance? <laughs> we assess formal education by sending them somewhere for three hours to sit a three hour final examination. Never mind about their performance and their behavior. They can get an A plus in a course called Pollution at our USB, and they step out of their lecture room and throw their litter on the ground, not in the bins that's there. <coughs> the processes of learning in our communities are also different. Okay? Some of the recurring, recurring themes that I have learned through my own study and through my own experience about our students who come from indigenous backgrounds some of the recurring themes um, include the emphasis on visual and spatial skills. Visual and spatial skills. The holistic and spontaneous nature of learning. I'm so happy here, um, if I might mention the co um, COL curriculum framework for sustainable development, where a holistic approach to learning is emphasized. And this fits in well with the, our notion of a holistic view of the world, a holistic way of teaching. Um, the importance of context in learning. We behave differently in different occasions. Context is so, so important. That's what you learn when you grow up. Okay? And behavior is, for us mainly, in a lot of specific communities, is determined by our kinship relationships. So we behave differently in different occasions. Okay, depending on your relation to someone who had died or someone who is getting married or in whatever context. You don't act equally to everybody. This, this is something that even um, my husband and I share. Somebody will say, well, you, you know, so I met so and so in such and such a place. He was very, very nice to me, but then I went and saw him some, at some other time. He pretended he didn't know me. And I said, the context is different. Okay, it's different. So you behave differently to different people, and that, for many of us, is okay. Learning by doing and participating. You want to learn how to behave, and when you're a young person, you go to a funeral, you follow your grandmother there, and you would learn. They don't say, well, now let's take a lesson on how to relate to so-and-so. You just watch them, and when you are, when they think you are 
um, it's enough, you have learned enough, and you can master that particular skill, they'll send you out. Go into this, go to get firewood, and you are not told to go and do something that you have not learned properly. I will skip some of the many examples that I put here. Um, given the important differences between our own traditional education and our modern education, contextualizing, which is a word Dr. Naidu likes, contextualizing is a very, very important skill for all Pacific educators. Um, let me now share with you my small attempt to contextualize uh, learning, teaching and learning, in case you may find that interesting, because that is what you are going to be doing in the next day or so, is to contextualize what you had learned from the data, from the research, and from all the things that you have learned about upskilling or um, developing capacity among Pacific groups. The first relates to my creating my, I read you a couple of funny poems. Um, I first tried to dabble in creative writing when I taught English in a high school in Tonga. When I had to teach this, uh, English literature to a group in Form 5 who had failed their school certificate. And I hated English when I was their age because I found it very, very difficult, especially poetry. So in my desperation to try and get through to my students, I asked them to collect their favorite Tongan songs, write down the words, and tell me why they like those songs. I also tried to write some verse, and fortunately the USB started its first um, center, USB center outside of Fiji in Tonga. Tonga was the first center that was created after Laudala. The director of the center was an English woman, Margaret Blando, <coughs> and she ran some creative writing classes in the evenings for those who were interested, and I thought I better go learn about creative writing. So. I would go to the class and then I would make up these verses and use that in my teaching. To teach basic elements of poetry appreciation, metaphors, symbolism, imagery, rhythm. So we used these and once they, un and they understood what these meant, then we moved on to the prescribed poems in the textbooks and they really enjoyed it. And I said, okay, now write your own poem. And they did. Some of them later um, were in, took up English at the university. So this was the way I contextualized teaching literature to my form five. And then since then, um, I, I also became interested in poetry. And I began to appreciate all the things I had to learn um, at school and at university. Plus the fact that I have become a little famous with the school kids because they now study my poems and many of them want to take selfies with me when they come to, to a USB, although some of them thought I had died. <laughs> <laughs> so I say, I say now, well, I wanted to write poetry so that students would, would see that you didn't have to be male, white, and dead to be a poet. <laughs> So, that was my example of um, trying to better contextualize my teaching. And the second one I'd like to show, um, share with you is my attempt to contextualize research. Because for me, unless you did that, um, it's not going to be complete, so to speak. So, in working for the university, I taught um, a course on research for my students at USP. And they, it was just so difficult for them. We, we had a textbook this thick from America on introduction to research with all the research paradigms and models and written in a language that I didn't even understand. So 
When I said, okay, I'd like you to do a mini research project, they just looked at me in desperation. Um, and so I said, but everybody can do research. You're a teacher, you can do your research to inform your teaching. And they were just nodding their heads. So in desperation, I thought, what can I use to, um, like I did in, in school, to get research through to them. So I thought, okay, I will use the metaphor a metaphor to, to tell them about research. And that was the origin of the Kakala Research Framework, which is now um, acceptable, I think, is the term. Because in two years ago, I was invited to write on the Kakala Research Framework for a book um, printed, um, published by Springer entitled An Encyclopedia in Educational Theories, Philosophies, in research. Then I got an invite to write a chapter on the Kakala Research Framework. So now, finally, the students say, ah, it's been accepted somewhere over there, so we can now use it. Anyway, the Kakala uh, Research Framework um, is borrowed from the, the Tongan uh, steps in making a garland. A Kakala is a garland, you know, like a salu salu, a hei, um, in, so I, the three steps, very important steps, very complicated steps in a sense, there's lots of protocols involved, uh, but basically it's very simple, gathering the flowers or the materials that you want to make your lay with, making it, and then gifting it. Those are the toli, tui, and luva. Okay, so you gather the materials, the flowers, for example, and in Tonga, um, flowers are ranked. Just like we rank people, we rank food, we rank everything. So flowers are ranked. The important flowers and the not so important flowers. So we put the important flowers on top, the not so important flowers on the bottom. So we put a heilala on top and friendship bunny on the bottom. Why? Hilala is highly ranked because it has a mythology. It has a story. It came from, from Pulotu, which is the Polynesian paradise, but the missionaries call it a, a heathen, an underworld. But Pulotu is paradise. Hilala came from there by someone who is half fish and half, half human. Frenchipani was introduced, so it has no mythology. Don't know where it came from. Randy knows where it originated, where the plant is a native of. We just know it was not, it didn't come from Kuloto, we, we put it underneath, it's not so important. You see how we value our indigenous knowledge? All right? It can be there to make it beautiful and nice smelling, but it's not as important as the halo. So we gather the material and then we make. We make the garland and it, the garland that you make is dependent on many things. Who is going to wear it? Are you giving it to the chief guest? Where is the chief guest from? Okay. Or are you giving it to a dancer who is going to perform in a, in a context like this? Where are our dancers, Dr. Naidu? So, you make this garland, and then the, f the third stage is the gifting. Huh? In Tonga, a garland has to be given away, and underpinning that gift is re um, compassion, offer, and whara'apa, respect. It has to be given away. So if I'm dancing and you give me a garland, you want me to perform a dance? <laughs> Not now. <laughs> when, when I finish, I will go out there and give you, gift a, that garland to somebody else. Have you ever been in a Cook Island Tamarind concert? The girls will come and dance, and the guys, unbeknownst to them, sitting in front. Mm -hmm. And after that, the girls will come with their hay or their kakala and put it on you and pull you up there. To, to perform the tamre. Okay? But then many guys don't realize that after that they have to give their garlands to someone else. 
keep it for yourself. So anyway, the three stages, and so I use this to explain research. Your collecting of data, selection of data, analyzing in TUI, you analyze which ones are more relevant than others, and then after that you write up the results and you present it. Present it to the supervisor to be examined or you present it to the development partners because they gave you the money to do your, your project. Hmm? You, you give it to them. You give the report. So that became the Kakala Research Framework and I work with people in New Zealand, particularly um, at the University of Auckland. They said, oh, this is very nice. And you know today, more students in, in New Zealand use the Kakala Research Framework compared to students at USB. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? Because the students, and many of the Pacifica students in New Zealand could relate to that. Our students here can relate to it, but they thought, oh, but that's, that's Pacific. It's not as important as the ones in the textbooks. However, two of my colleagues have critiqued the car, <coughs> and that was very, very important. They have critiqued it. As a research framework, we now have five stages. So before the toli is teu, teu is preparation. They wanted it to be put out there. Teu is preparation, and the last stage, instead of luva, luva is still there, but the final stage is mafana and malie together, which is monitoring and evaluation. So that makes the Kakala framework very important for project evaluation, research project evaluation, because it's not made clear in the LUVA. You know, people will just take their Kakala and say thank you very much, and they won't tell you whether, how was it? Was it a nice cacao? Was it nice smelling? Uh, so now it's a lot more robust, this, this contextualization of mine. Um, I wanted to move quickly because I don't want to bore you to death. So I, those are two examples of the, what I did, which I think you can, um, can use that experience and create, create your own framework. Create your own framework for doing what you are supposed to be doing, making sure that it's meaningful to the people that you are going to be working with. So what is it in relation to the future in terms of what we as Pacific Islanders continue to be required to contextualize what it is we learn? Because that's what you and I have been doing and will continue to do. You will go places, you would learn new things, but in the as they say at the end of the day, you have to deal with a specific group of people that you assign to in order to help them build their capacities. So what can we do to further advance the contextualization of our work, especially in relation to the use of the modern technologies and the kinds of things that you heard from BBC Naidu, that USB is, <coughs> well, has pioneered and has continued to improve over the years. So in relation to capacity building activities in many of our islands today, I believe that we need to recognize the knowledges and the understandings that already exist in our communities, in our countries, to build capacity in different areas and in different contexts. This is a big ask because, you know, I had to learn that about my own country. Many of us don't have opportunities to look at what already exists in terms of our traditional knowledge. This is particularly so in relation to ensuring the search for equivalent notions and concepts within the area of our concerns. To me, that's the most difficult um, thing, is to look at equivalent concepts, because we have concepts that may not be like the ones that we are learning from the books. Youth, for example. What is young? What is, who is a youth? How do you belong to a group called the youth group? 
In Tonga, a Tavo is a youth, and a Tavo is someone who, um, who has at least one parent still alive. So even if you're 40 and both your parents are alive, you are a talavo. <laughs> is that a UN definition of a youth? I mean, it's a funny kind of example, but that's what I'm talking about. Looking at how we conceptualize some of these um, problem areas. Um, the other thing in terms of contextualization, we have to look very carefully at how our own cultures in our own societies define or conceptualize. I mean, women. We talk about gender equality as if women everywhere are, are the same. Well, they are maybe in terms of their biology, but there are so many different social contexts in which we talk about women. And you've got to take that into account. In Tonga, Socially, women are higher ranked than men. Can you believe that? Given the violence against women that's happening in that country, you wouldn't believe that they are socially ranked higher hmm, than men. So look at how you can turn that around and use the traditional notion of a woman in terms of trying to um, advance the gender debate as defined by the United Nations. In relation to empowerment, in my experience, a more holistic approach seems to work better, especially in relation to people being serious about their responsibilities, whether these be at work or at university. In 1995, the USB Extension Services conducted research on Pacific women and distance education. Dr. Naidu has a book to attest to that. The results showed how women were underrepresented in education and therefore enabling them to study via distance um, as seen as a way of accessing higher education and thus empowering them to take up employment outside of the home and pursue further studies. However, two decades later, we find more females um, than males graduating from USP and many more females receiving gold medals, especially in the sciences, compared to men. But these figures do not translate to more women in employment or leadership positions in many of our countries. So we need to look at related areas and perhaps develop capacity among decision makers, leaders, managers, as well as those and as well as others who are mostly men, to ensure that empowered women get somewhere, break the glass ceiling. We have, now we have empowered so many of them. We don't give them a, we don't give them positions of responsibility. We also need to more carefully examine women's role in society, in the church, in politics, in universities, in the corporate sector, etc. Finally, I believe that if capacity building is to bear real fruit, everyone needs to work together to enable those whose capacity is being built to use their newfound capacity to achieve their goals. At our university where I work, we have just celebrated 50 years of capacity building for 12 member countries. If one judges the success of capacity building in terms of the number of foreign consultants that have come to USP in the last 10 years or so to teach us how to teach, how to do research, how to use IT to enhance our work, you would have concluded that we had failed in our capacity building in many, many important areas. But this is not the case. What we have failed to do in our capacity building was not to include Pacific values in our leaders, in our politicians, that would enable them to be relational beings who care not just about the bottom line, but who care for the workers, who help create the profit in the first place. Not to enjoy the various boys club on a Friday evening, but to think of those women who go home after a hard day's work, whether in a hospital, a school, or shop anywhere to cook someone's dinner. Modern technologies cannot deliver these so-called soft skills. 
I don't know why they were called soft skills. The skills of compassion, of honesty, of selflessness, of humility, respect, sharing, and responsibility for the collective good. These are the soft skills that will ensure success in learning other skills and to build real capacity among people, irrespective of who they are, where they come from, or what jobs you are preparing them to do in the future. So I want to leave with a positive outlook when it comes to the future. Our own knowledge systems, our value systems have the potential to be an alternative route to empowerment, cultural capital, sustainability and capacity building. We need to help one another's struggles to regain and reclaim ownership of our own knowledge and value systems, our ways of doing things and our relationality, despite the reality of our various countries, economic dependence on our development partners. But they seem to be now genuinely interested in ensuring that what we do with their money is successful. For me, I want to thank you for organizing this meeting and for asking me to share with you my own experiences of contextualizing. This is a lifeline to our work in advocating and promoting Pacific centered ways of doing and being. They are important foundations for our sustainable livelihood, our cultural survival, and our sustainability. So come now, take this kakala, symbol of our oneness, tie it around you where it will flourish in the nourishing way only the sky knows. Never mm -hmm.